Good afternoon and welcome to another in a series of Saturday Sports Special, a part of Talk Sports, where we speak with the movers and shakers of sports, the sportsmen, the sportswomen, the administrators, present and past. Well, this week, this weekend in particular, our special guest is no stranger to sports in Grenada and possibly the Caribbean. Um, he's a former national footballer, national captain, now administrator. We're speaking about the president of the Grenada Football Association, a one time vice president of the Caribbean Football Association. We welcome Mr. Chenny Joseph to our program. Good afternoon to you, uh, Mr. Joseph. How are things? Uh, in my neck of the woods, I'm fine. Good afternoon to you and all who's looking at your program. Okay, that's uh, that's that's um, that's good to hear. And um, probably I started by asking you, as I have asked uh, many of our past um, guests on the program, how have you been coping with the pandemic? Well, um, I have not had the privilege of relaxing like most people. Um, uh, maybe for a maximum of one week, I was away from office, but uh, pretty much even during the lockdown here in Grenada, I have been working, going to the office um, almost every day of the week, um, trying to satisfy my customers. And um, I've just been trying my best to play it safe, um, adhering to as many of the protocols. Sometimes may I may have forgotten sometimes, but... The majority of time I've been trying to cope and to do things right. I must say, must be, you have a very nice backdrop there, um, but it looks as if it's sort of overcast. <laughs> yeah, it's been raining very heavy earlier on. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, you're seeing um, from my vantage point uh, the view I get sometimes when I'm in my veranda. That's um, very good to hear. The, um, I'm not, I'm, okay. So let's um, get the ball rolling. It's um, football. Um, as president of the Grenada Football Association, but let's start off first to find out what's happening in terms of football this weekend. Any activities planned? Uh, what do you know of? Yeah, um, actually, there is uh, some U19 games. Uh, last weekend, the U19 football, GFA U19 football started, and also the U15 had concluded on the same day. Or on the weekend and um last week we had uh four matches in the wagiti super knockout in the round of 16 and there's another two games today and two tomorrow uh, those games today should be exciting and those tomorrow also one notable observation is that our national u17 boys have been participating and they're still in um if they did in fact manage to win tomorrow um, it means they'll get into the quarterfinal, and I'm hopeful that it might happen for them. Okay, and um, Chenny, all kudos to the Grenada Football Association, especially in terms of leading uh, the um, re well, what I should say, in the not even post COVID, <laughs> but in terms of getting sports back. Um, I thought I, the, the GFA took the lead, and I think after there was the Grenada Cricket Association in terms of, I think it just started with the Pure Grenada Cup and um, other such tournaments. Now we have the Wagi T um, tournament also. But what was the thinking behind that in terms of the GFA, and in, especially working along with the, um, the other stakeholders like the Ministry of Health in, in, in getting um, football restarted? Well, if I could take you back to around the time when the government announced that the country was going on lockdown, it was just a few days away from our national team playing two international friendly. We had a game scheduled against Martinique and then another against um, Suriname. Both of them were going to be away games. And a few days after the Pure Grenada Cup was scheduled to start, as well as the U15 had started, um, when government made the announcement that the place was going to be locked down, uh, we couldn't just sit idly by and say, well, okay, um, let's not do anything. It's an excuse to not work and, you know, just relax. What we have to take on board is that 
more than a thousand plus players were affected by that decision because it means that people were just sitting home um you know watching television eating food getting fat and um what we decided is um during the lockdown let's have a series of virtual meetings we had many virtual meetings with the executive um i had a few meetings with the staff of the gfa virtually and then we had about uh, four or five meetings with uh, the general council now while all of that was going on the secretariat was working hard in communication with um the ministry of health the government and uh we were and i hope i'm not blowing our trumpet but we were the first to write a very detailed um protocol to allow for the resumption of football in fact very early we submitted that same document to the Ministry of Health. We also submitted it to the Olympic Committee and recommended to them that it might be worth looking at and encourage other sporting associations to do likewise. Um, I think then um, a few of the associations uh, followed suit. But um, we were always planning during that time. We had meetings with FIFA. We had meetings with CONCACAF. We met with um, consultants. Um, we reviewed our strategic plan and made some adjustments to it because you know for the period that we were locked down uh, we would have lost time and uh, activities during that period so we were doing a lot and um uh when they gave us the green light was to first do the fa cup we had four teams remaining in the tournament and we were able to get permission to allow that four teams to start training once those four teams started training, people started getting some excitement. In fact, other people started going out into the field and kicking ball without even the approval. But then the Ministry of Health would have um, encouraged organizations to do similar protocols like we did. Um, we asked clubs to take note of all who's attending training do the temperature check we could not do those um pcr tests and the rest of it but we did almost everything that was requested to ensure that everyone participating in football was safe and and overall you will say chenny that um that well i, I don't want to say initiative but that um decision taken by the gfa um voted well for football uh, for 2020 under the circumstances i will say to you it's one of our better years um i i said to a few people and i say here to you and to whoever is listening or watching um the covid 19 to me is an opportunity rather than just seeing it as a pandemic um it gave us a chance to revisit many of the things we were doing it gave us a chance to do some tweaking to some of those things we were doing and more importantly it gave us a chance to also reflect on things we weren't doing good um i will say to you i feel good about the fact that not only we've had a series of competitions playing um during those periods we've been able to engage our affiliates um the stakeholders and to help them start reorganizing themselves as clubs um it's something that i hope we'll talk about a little later on but we have done well and in fact i will say to you in that short time between june and now the amount of football that has played and the quality has been good also is significant and um, we continue to do more and uh, as i indicated before in another forum um i think the gfa is doing a wonderful job um be before we go on Chenny, to talk a little more on the administrative side of football in in grenada in particular um Let's, let's talk a bit about the Chenny Joseph, the former footballer, one former footballer. I, I just I'm still a footballer. I'm still a footballer. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, the Chenny Joseph, because I recall um, speaking to uh, Ryan O'Brien from St. Lucia, our good friend Ryan O'Brien from St. Lucia yesterday. And he was, you know, he said, I, I, I noticed that you're speaking to Chenny Joseph um, tomorrow, which is today. And he's, he was talking about recalling the days of Winwood Islands tournament, to be exact, yeah. you know, we've a tournament. 
And we are looking at some of the players, albeit some of them, especially in St. Lucia, some St. Lucians, not, you know, um, I'll focus now, some of them, you know, gone on the side and things like that. So, but just let's look at your era back then in the eighties, um, playing football, representing Grenada, playing in these tournaments, whether it's the Windward Islands tournament or regional tournament, what it was like, Jenny? Uh, it's a lot to, to, to speak about. And um, I will say to you openly, uh, football, football is a master of life. Football teaches people how to be disciplined. It helps you with the ability to engage people in conversations. Um, it has created friendship, long-lasting friendship. It has created many opportunities for me. If I was to go back to when I first started playing or started being around football, I would say, I was probably about uh, eight, nine years. And um, some may say I was a little bit kind of nosy. Um, I remember the national team training and uh, Roy St. John and Papa and Lahey and those kinds of people. And one day, Plug called out to me and he said, hey, you little boy, come here, come here. And um, he said, can you read and write? I said, yes, sir, you know. And um, from then on, he appointed me to call out the register for the national training. And the reason why I had to do the register is because uh, players were refunded um, for attending training. So he then started giving me the money to share out to these people. I remember that well. And um, then a gentleman by the name of John Diabo uh, saw me once in the park. I was probably about 11 years. And he said to me, um, you will be a national footballer one day. I had no idea that I wanted to play football because the truth is I feel I was better in cricket. And um, I then started playing. And the more John Diabo started seeing me, the more he was impressed. And then one day out of the blues, he gave me a pair of uh, Puma, black and yellow Puma boots. And thereafter, I remember Alistair Tellisford. And Alistair would be forever somebody I will always regard highly. Alistair Tellisford started bringing me in the park whenever Atoms was playing. And when I heard people talking about Alistair or seeing what Alistair was doing on the field of play, I started feeling I wanted to be like him. And you know what was my work for Alistair back then when I was probably about 12, 13? Every training session Alistair finished, I had to go clean his shin guard, clean his boots, soak his uh, pants if it was very dirty, and then, you know, make sure it's kind of scrubbed a little bit before his mom, Miss Louisa, take it and wash it. And then I started doing that often, and wherever Atoms was going on, Alistair would bring me with him. And I started getting into the park when Grenada was playing, and that time Alistair had returned from the U.S. And I will get into the park free. I will be in the dressing room. And I felt like, you know, this is something I could probably try. And um, at age 17, I, I always refer to my story, um, how I got onto Grenada national team. And it's a unique one. By then, I had moved from Atoms to Queen's Park Rangers, but I could not make uh, Queen's Park Rangers for C11. Um, and if you made the bench, you were not likely to get game. But then, for some reason, some Queen's Park Rangers players boycotted um, representing St. George's in the parish tournament. And there was a Brazilian coach who was in Grenada at the time. And I said, sir, I can run home from my boots and come and play. He said, where you live? And I told him where I was living. And I ran home quickly, came back, sat on the bench for about half an hour, maybe the first half. And then he said, all right, let's put on that little boy. And that was the beginning of my career as a national player. Um, he thought I was one of the better players. I remember being offered the opportunity to go to Brazil to play in a lower division football, but there was one little catch behind it. Um, at that point in time, I, you know, I've always been a skinny guy, right? So they, they, I think I was 18 or 19, and they wished that I was like 15. And so they attempted to get a passport saying that I was younger. And that didn't work out. So I didn't get to go to Brazil 
with the um, support from that coach. Um, I then went on to play for the national team for the next 15 years, although um, when I made my second effort at um, playing for Grenada, it was here in Grenada, we were hosting the 1985 tournament. I got into the national team in 84, but the 1985 UEFA tournament, um, Brian Brimlow is my good friend. Um, he was also a national basketball player. And even though Grenada was playing in the UEFA tournament, Brim had the intention of going and play basketball the night. And I had the privilege of being with him. He was a captain then. And I ran away from camp at Mama's um, wanting to go and get a haircut or trim, as we would call it, in River Road. And on my way back, that was November the 17th, 1985, I crashed and um, I was pretty much home for the next month. I mean, I lost almost every part of my body. So these are some of the things I remember. I also remember playing for Grenada. I was the captain. No, I wasn't the captain. But we won the tournament, the UEFA tournament in St. Lucia. However, the St. Lucians were expecting St. Lucia to be the favorite to win. And um, when we were leaving, we were living near La Clary. And um, some St. Lucians started stoning the bus. And the driver ran out of the bus and left us, the national players, where we were going back to the hotel. No, not the hotel, the airport. And Steve Mark, may he rest in peace. And Pele said, but Kenny, you could drive. And, you know, I took the bus. And I drove from La Clary down to the airport. Um, I always remember that story. And that was a weird one. Um, another story I remember good in Wefa. I mean, these are just some moments. I hope you have the patience. Um, in Dominica, um, that's the year we came last. I think it was 1987. We came last, but we lost some penalty kick, by the way. I might just let you know. It wasn't that we came last being humiliated. And um, Ali Di Bellot was the coach, I think. And um, after the goal scored and against us, against uh, Dominica, I then put the entire squad in the goal while the ball was in the net still. And I said, watch me. I don't care if it costs me being on a national team again. This is what we're going to do. This is where you're going to play. And I changed around the team. And we were able to get an equalizer. But anyhow, that was a moment where um, it didn't go down too good with the coach. And then another moment I will always remember, um, that time I was captain though, and the coach of the national team selected a squad which we didn't feel was good enough to win. So I called a few senior players. We were in my room up in um, on the lane. I forgot the name of the place. Um, there was a hotel up on the lane. And we changed the squad, we won the game, and guess what? Every single person who participated in that discussion where the decision was made that night was left on the bench in the next game. So these are some of the Winwood Island moments I remember. But um, WIFA, WIFA was always one place that, or tournament, sorry, that really allowed for us to build friendship. And many of the guys, um, Kentish was a footballer, by the way, Thomas Kentish. We still remain friends. Glenn Etienne, who is now the president of Dominica Football. Um, I remember him. You know, and many others, um, not only that, the Marcuson tournament. I remember Rangers going to both St. Lucia and Barbados, and we made friends there. So football for me has been great, and um, I feel like I'm giving back, even though at times it has been hard. Okay, well, um, it's interesting, eh? because... Um I see a good friend um, is bigging you up, well, shouting up, but he made mention of a guitar pan player. Um, I'm not certain whether this is true, Cherry. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I um, well, Clarkson was coaching the national team, and I'll give you a little joke about it. I remember I spoke about my accident with the motorbike. Um, that's how I moved. I started playing pan with um, Angel Harps, and I spent three years there. But because of the accident where I cost Grenada the championship when we were hosted, Claxton tell me, don't come back in the pan house. So I then moved from there and I went to Guinness. And I played with Guinness until Guinness broke up in 1987. And then I moved to Comancheros. 
But then when the national team started playing a lot more games, I then, you know, decided Pan wasn't something that I could continue playing, but um, it's something I'll always love, you know. And I think Pan is another discipline that really teaches people how to be able to, you know, respect authority, how to concentrate, how to focus on things. And I will say to you, Pan and football, these are two things that has helped me. Okay. Uh, well, um, you, you spoke quite a bit about um, UEFA and St. Lucia. And obviously, um, David Gray would like to say that um, that's uh, winner Stevie watching from St. Lucia. Great work on spearheading such a vibrant Grenada Football Association. It is a real functioning model for other uh, football associations across the region. You and your team are setting a high standard. Kudos to you and your team. Keep working. Um, definitely, Gray is um, expressing some sentiments, Jenny, in terms of um, Windward Island's football. I, I don't know what is what has been happening of recent in terms of the other um, associations within the Windward Islands grouping, but it appears from based on what Gray is saying that uh, Grenada continues to lead in terms of um, football associations in the sub-region. You have been part of the discussions over the years regarding Windward Island football reviving, Windward Island football um, spearheading, getting uh, Barbados a part of the WIFA tournament, these sort of things. What has been happening regarding Windward Island football, Shelley? Well, I think the WIFA tournament, well, it's two years now, but we have been budgeting for and advocating the continuation of that tournament. Um, I hope I'm not putting myself on, or putting anyone on the spot, but the Grenada Football Association believes, and me as president believe, that WIFA tournament is a necessary staple for the development of football in our region. I think it has produced people like myself, and many others, and there's no reason why a president or presidents of the WIFA um, territories would not want it to continue. Now, WIFA was formed when there was insufficient games for uh, the four islands of the Winwood Island. And some may argue, well, you have a lot more tournament now, you have CFU tournaments, CONCACAF tournaments, FIFA tournaments, but I have a different view on it. I believe that WIFA is a tournament that should continue for as long as we can and i believe all associations should budget for it however i would like to put a little spin to what i think we can do also i believe that associations are getting more money now from fifa for the um, development of the sport in our region and i see no reason why we can't consider having an under 13 WIFA tournament, an under-15 WIFA tournament, and an under-17 WIFA tournament. And the reason why I say that is, if you look at the history of Caribbean football, the Windward Islands has not produced sufficient professional footballers. I did not say we have not pro produced sufficient good players. We've produced many quality players in all four islands. However, professionally, not much has moved, not much players have moved from amateur to professional. And part of the reason might be that when these players are discovered, they are discovered at a very late age, 20, 21, 22. I mean, I know Velox and, and um, Jack in St. Vincent and Henderson. I know St. Lucia has had a few, Dominica also, and we have had a few. But I believe if we could take the WIFA tournament and bring it down to U13, U15, U17, and then engage uh, some of the bigger clubs, uh, whether it's in the Caribbean or Europe, to start seeing our youngsters at a much earlier age. I believe we will produce a lot more professional players, and it will benefit these islands going forward. The other spin I would like to put on it is that you could maybe... Uh, once every two years have uh, two invitational teams so that the quality of our games can improve. So whether it is Martinique, uh, Guadeloupe, uh, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, whoever, you invite one or two of them um, to participate just to make the tournament itself a little bit more exciting. We are not trying to do what CONCACAF or CFU is doing, but I believe the more football we play, the better we will be and the, the more the chances are for our youngsters to get a break out there. Um, 
Well, that's quite a lot, Jenny. We have, I hope we have um, enough time because we have so much to talk about. But um, um, your friends are already giving you some banter there. You know, tourists talking about half Spanish <laughs> Jenny, and then he, he uh, said that um, fully welcome as part of RFG newsroom team. I guess as much that's a, a media team. And Homian is actually saying that the um, the name of the, well, Hazelan, I should say, not Homian, Hazelan, sorry. That's Griffith. It was Hamilton Hill. That's yeah. the one that's on Luther's Lane, right? Yeah, that's the name. That's the name, Miss Adams. Veronica, Veronica Adams, Adams yeah. yeah. Thanks, Hazelan, for that um, memory, I should say. I, I was trying to remember the name myself. Hamilton <laughs> Inn. It's you know, a very popular hotel for um, sporting teams, eh? Correct. But you know, um, I always remember my first job um, after leaving school. When I want to say first job, first major job. Toro was um, an editor um, at Radio Free Grenada, and I'll bring back Toro memory to a very unfortunate scenario that happened to me. Now, when they recognized at um, RFG, that's Radio Free Grenada, that I was doing sufficiently good, they then started allowing me to be able to do my sports reports or sports news, sorry, without the assistance of the editor. And I did not understand the politics of the day was so sensitive. There was a Polish footballer by the name, Polish or East German footballer by the name of Boniak. He was a very great player. And I did this story because he had... Um, let's put it this way he had uh absconded from the east meaning and he went to west germany so the world knew this player boniak and i thought it was a big story so i also put it there well toro and um, patrick smichael and them then send me to nistep and tell me i need to understand the politics you know how could i promote someone uh leaving the east and going to the west and make that a big story on on, on news you know so i remember that in particular <laughs> well um i guess as much um the toro and the ray and others will probably remember <laughs> because once you mentioned the names um patrick smichaels and others you know in the newsroom yeah. um Jenny, in recent times especially over the last few months the gfe seemingly was in what we would consider a turmoil back and forth um in the media um factions you know um and at the same time you know people were of the view that it was hampering the development of football court matters you know just name it uh, uh, in terms of sports in grenada during that time it was football the grenada football association and in most cases Chenny Joseph was the center of all this controversy. But within that period of time as well, um, you can probably point, and I think others, there's no um, secret about that, to so many things that have been taking place with football in Grenada as well. Um, and some, for some people, it might be surprising that with all that has been happening, so, many, so much they took place in terms of development. Um, GFA headquarters, for example, is one um qualification for the CONCACAF gold cup is another which is uh, which is big and i think you may want to speak to that in terms of boasting as um as president of gfa grenada qualified three times and twice under your leadership um women's qualification or participation in CONCACAF tournaments as well jenny um let's talk about the controversies and probably um segue into what has been achieved thus far um is covid put a, a a pause on the controversies within the gfa okay i'll answer your question differently and when i say differently i hope you have the patience to hear me um on that i i tend to feel comfortable riding over the heavy waves um i'm not a great surfer but um I spend little time on what I call the melee and the confusions because I, I know deep inside my vision for football is a good one and the 
direction in which the Grenada Football Association is going is the right one. Some may not like my leadership style. I cannot always please everyone. And if I want to please everyone, then I want to be doing a good job. However, um, it was unfortunate what was done by those who did it when they did it. And um, I always felt it was a motive that was there long before I even became president. And when I say that meaning, I remember wanting to be the president um, a few years before that. And I lost by one vote to Ram Folks, a good friend of mine, by the way. And I say that, and Ram, if you are watching, um, I do not say things I don't mean. I have respect for you and thanks for the contribution you have made also in my life in football. And I lost to Ram Folks by one vote. However, before I lost to Ram by one vote, prior to the runoff, I had beaten the two other candidates, which was Ram and Paul Roberts. And I was convinced that I was going to become president. But what was stated is I was too young. It was said that I was too young, so it was not the best time for me. And I stayed out of football for two years. I was nowhere around football. And I'm saying nowhere around. And then I was approached by persons to consider running for office because at that time, I think they had put Ram and his executive on, I think they had put an interim body in place. And I always like to qualify that I was nowhere wrong those times when Ram folks was running GFA. But it seemed like if I was staged, in other words, you know, I hope I don't get into trouble. The U.S. sometimes impose government on people. I think that was the intention of those who had asked me to go. And I went on a pause. And I remember I cried a lot because it was about a month after my mom's death. May she rest in peace. And immediately we started going forward with... Um, ideas about development. I remember insisting that the GFA, for example, should have published um, regulation. I believe we should have um, hard copy of our AGM documents. And people started saying, well, he was too much into the glitz and glamour. But I believe in accountability. Um, the company I've worked for for the last 20 something years have taught me a lot. And those same things is what I use today in my life. If it ain't true, don't do it. And if you are going to deliberately do something to hurt someone, be prepared for the backlash. And so whatever was the motive behind the attempt, it failed. And I was hoping that once it failed and we were all back together, everything would be normal. It has not gotten normal, and I'm not going to pretend to you that it's normal. But I'm one who very often, I don't say the very fancy prayers, but I ask God to guide every action I take, whether it is in my work, in football, wherever. And I'm saying to you that the executive committee Despite our challenges, I think we're doing an excellent job. There's about maybe more than 100 things I can say we've done different and better than previous administration. I remember when no one believed that it was possible that a GFA could own a building and persons even stated that, why do you use your resources? I remember two good friends of mine, Barry Collimo and... Um, uh, Robbie, what's Robbie's name again? Robert. Um, anyhow, I can't remember his name. Um, oh, Bobby Steele. Bobby Steele. Both of them said to me, Chenny, I, I don't see why you should spend all that money on GFA in building an office. And I said, I think we are thinking about today. I said, the administrative building is not for Chenny Joseph era. It is for the GFA years to come. And today, that same building now not only has 
an office where we can sit down and discuss football. Today we had a council meeting. We sit in our own conference room and have our council meetings. And above that, we now have what I call a short-term um, place for our national teams to stay. And there uh, are as much as 30 beds, excuse that our national players can stay there, train, eat right there, build relationship, the rest of it. That's just one. I remember I was told by some people again that the best place to put lights for football in Grenada would be either Tantin or Mon Rouge. And I said to them, I don't agree. Um, St. Patrick, in my opinion, has been producing quality players consistently. It was also stated that St. Patrick was considered one of the more impoverished places in Grenada. And so I said, why not us go to St. Patrick's with a light? And I got licks for that. Then subsequently, we put seating for 1,200 persons in St. Patrick. And I continue to get licks for it. But I believe it is for a good reason. And if you look at the history, now we're producing quality players. And I think there's a motivation by some of these same players, whether it is the Libre boy, the Brady, or whoever. We are producing quality players, right? Joe Marx and others. What I basically can say to you is, there's nothing any government or any leader will do that 100% of the population will support. But if you ask me, the Grenada Football Association has made tremendous progress under my leadership, thanks to the executive committee, the support they have been given. And even where at present we have, I call it a split, I think the split is good for the sport at this time because it keeps people like myself you know on check but i believe the quality of the delivery from us is well recognized and regarded yesterday we had a meeting with the minister for sport the new minister for sport honorable bain osford and she herself said you guys are doing much more than i thought i mean why is it that you guys not talking about the things you're doing what you what seem to be coming out often michael is the negative and i won't spend much time on those so i hope in a way your listeners are more comfortable with my response and i'm not here to speak much about those negative things but wouldn't you agree that uh to some extent, um, the negatives outweigh the, the positives. In fact, that um, it, it, it takes quite a while, quite some effort on your part to get the positive out because the negative seems to be outweighing the, what you consider, I should say the negative, um, outweighing what you perceive as a positive. I think our biggest weakness right now is our communication. If we were to be doing better communicating with the general public and our clubs, I think some of the negatives will be overshadowed. Um, if you ask me, for example, uh, when I first got into the GFA, we were not giving clubs any support whatsoever. All they were doing is playing competition and you pay them prize monies. From the time I became president, we have had situations where now all of our affiliates are receiving financial contributions from the GFA. We started off with 5,000 per club. We moved to 10,000 per club. And from this year, we were given each club $15,000. So pretty much um, under my manifesto, the last time I went back, I said, let's pass it forward. And pass it forward was simply saying, let us take the FIFA model and introduce it here in Grenada, which we are doing. Some people are not yet seeing our vision in that regard. We continue to give them support in terms of equipment. We don't talk about that. We produce a set of C license and D license and B license coaches from CONCACAF. We don't talk enough about that. So now we have a lot more coaches. We introduced club licensing in 2014. Some clubs are still struggling doing it right. Some clubs are still not functioning. 
but the effort of the GFA to institute all these things is aimed at improving the football. Women's football, when I first became president and we tried to do international games for women, we didn't even have a domestic tournament. And people used to scoff at us and say, the girls going and play and to get the plenty nil. Our girls have qualified in more tournaments than before. In fact, they made history last year by becoming the first ever Grenada female team to qualify for a CONCACAF final. Our U15 girls made it to the B-level final against Bermuda and lost 2-1. There are more girls playing football now. We give financial support to girls' football. We also give support to, or gave support, sorry, to both primary and secondary school football teams including sponsoring uniforms for all of those teams. We have just two, a year and a half ago given all the GFA affiliates a complete kit. We've increased prize monies for all competition. We've introduced Pure Grenada Cup where every player in the Pure Grenada Cup gets an appearance fee, $100 per player per game. The prize money for the Pure Grenada Cup is significant. And I think if only people spend time on the positive, these small negative things that a few are going to do, and by the way, I will say it openly, the detractors are there not because they don't realize what we're doing, but it's, I guess it's because they are not the ones who are leading the charge to get these things done. But there are so much. Um, as I speak to you now, we are discussing with government about doing additional work in full as well as to construct our uh, technical center. We are now in League One, or League A, sorry, of CONCACAF. We started our road to the CONCACAF Nations League, or the Gold Cup, sorry. We were ranked, in case you don't know, Michael, we were ranked 32nd in CONCACAF when it started. And we've qualified not only for the Gold Cup, but we qualified for the CONCACAF League A. In other words, we're in the same big group with Panama, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Mexico, US, Canada, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. well, well, interesting enough, Jenny, because um, the, the argument will also be, um, if that is so, then what is being done is all well and good to say that we're in the big league, but is um, maintaining your status in the big league with Panama and you know and those other teams because those other teams are playing international friendlies, getting themselves ready to you know to make their claim in the big league. But what is happening with um, Spice Boys? Right. So very good observation, and I see merit in what you're saying. But the good news about um, football is that there's always a chance for you to improve on anything you're doing. Let me just say that to you. We were expected to play two games this month um, against Barbados. It didn't work out yet. It might be that we might play them later. We were supposed to play also Panama. We were supposed to play Nicaragua. And we were supposed to play this one other team. Oh, Trinidad is um, looking at playing us. However, we don't have control over what's happening externally with COVID. The Prime Minister of Barbados stated to the Barbados Football Association that she cons she's concerned about the welfare of her constituents. And likewise, I will say to you, I will not feel comfortable putting 18 players or 20 players at risk, sending them to an unknown place to receive a positive results from COVID or put them maybe at risk of dying just to say that, oh, well, the others are doing it and we're not going to do it. I am convinced to myself, the government here in Grenada has done a great job. We're just about 37 or 38 um, positive cases compared to many other places. And I think it's the right thing we've done by not take, taking part in any games um during this kind of situation i think the players risk i mean the player's life is more important than our stats or any fame or whatever comes with it okay um <clears throat> let, let's just take some um 
comments that came in while you were speaking there, Jenny, um, and then we'll flow again with the program. Earlier, Colin James said, um, I agree with Jenny Ree. WIFA youth tournaments, the breeding ground for future professional players, and I think Toro was referring to your statement earlier. That was better than sending you to Richmond Hill, so I assume. Um, then, was it Richmond Hill or was it um, in, in um, Hopeville? Uh, Hopeville, Hopeville. <laughs> I think you were ball headed at that time, so I'll be Richmond Hill. Um, yeah. What are the GFA plans for women's football in the primary school? I think that's a concern that's always been raised in terms of um, sports in the primary school. So um, David will always ask whether it's football, whether it's cricket, whether it's basketball in the primary school, something you can talk about. Um, let's get some more comments here. Um, the Sterling in St. Lucia many years ago, I have, hope I'm not mistaken. Um, I think that was a comment in St. Lucia. Still not quite understand that, but then, um, visionary leadership at its best. Um, Clev is saying here that um, uh, soccer sports ex uh, in exclusively and pan exclusively are proven disciplines, anchors chain to academics and have shaped many stable scholars who now occupy seats behind pulpits and now sit around tables in making decision in politics. Goes without saying, Clev, this is true indeed. Um, the negative get more publicity than the positive. And um, I can't imagine where the Old Trafford, big field, small field competition and competitors would be with such resources. The Yankee man sack, Body Boy, Barry, Remo, Boy Boy, Belfort Brothers, etc., etc. Rupert Williams, or Big Bear, and Charlie Hood made magic with the little they had then. It is true, as we all know, that um, the Old Trafford League, Jenny, in those days, and they... I'm a graduate. Clef is actually saying that, you know, could you imagine that sort of resources available to these guys um, that put these things on in those days? But I want you to comment um, to the earlier comment regarding uh, women's football in the primary schools. Um, it seems like... Um... David is somehow either walking alongside me as the spirit that I need to guide me, or he was in the room yesterday. We had a very lengthy and productive discussion with a new minister for sport. Uh, accompanying her was the director for sport, as well as the permanent secretary in that ministry. And representing the GFA was um, Jerry Alexis, Alvin Clouden, and myself. And one of the things that we indicated to the Ministry of Sport is that we would like to get an MOU going between ourselves, the Ministry of Sport, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Youth, and to allow for us to be able to lend some more expertise and resources to help develop it in the primary school. In fact, one good thing I can mention is that the Ministry of Sport is committed to allowing now for all of the football coaches to be trained by the GFA. And we are going to have these same coaches go back into the primary school. It is our intention to sponsor both male and female primary school football starting from the next term. Once the teachers do not put uh, any kind of pressure on the ministry or whoever to prevent these guys from being able to play. But um, David, you're right. Um, I am a big supporter of that. We were supposed to have started a national on the 13 league. Um, it did not get started, but I am, I, I am assured that it will start in January. We are launching also on the 9th of January, the GFA national grassroots program. I will also make reference to the fact that every single football academy on the island that is recognized and or established will receive financial and material support from the GFA from as early as maybe December 9th or 10th. And uh, we hope that uh, all of these things will allow for better uh, players being produced. One quick thing though, I just want to kind of go back to the Tantine Old Trafford beer competition, both the one in Old Trafford and the Tantine playing field. If you look back at history and maybe even long before me, um, 
some of the best footballers that emerged from St. George's was as a result of these two competitions. Whether it was playing for Hanford, playing for Carnage, Queen's Park Rangers, Atoms, you name it, Dauntless, whoever. Some of the best footballers were as a result of this competition. And I don't know why, and that's just a question I always ask, why do some people try to fix something that is not broken? In fact, I experience it here in the GFA too. Um, some things are going extremely good, but we just feel, well, we need change. Because I hear, I hear the call for, for my time to expire. And I will say to you, Michael, um, the beer or the Tantine Old Trafford competitions are a competition that must be revisited. I've called on the St. George's Parish Rep more than once to restart that competition or get in conjunction with persons together because I played five years of the under 16 Old Trafford competition. Coco won every single year. Right, Coco United, we won every single year, and I will tell you that I have a photo. I sorry, I didn't send it to you. Almost 75 percent of that Coco team went on to represent Grenada at some level, whether it was Zagada Cyrus, Franklin Drayton, may he rest in peace. Um, uh, Ricky Charles, I mean, not Ricky Charles, Ricky Cyrus, you know, Brigo, uh, myself, my brother Ling, Ling represented Grenada at U, U 20 level. You know, um, so much players, Gavin Hostin, Keith Fletcher, you know, you can call names, uh, Eddie Bernard, and I'm talking about my era. And uh, for some reason, we don't see that. But I hope that somehow somebody will volunteer to assist in getting that tournament back and running because Manjalu benefited from it, All Blacks benefited from it, St. Paul's be benefited from it, even teams in the South benefited from those competitions. Well, I, you know, and interestingly enough, Jenny, because, um, you know, someone from the River Road area and growing up, you'll know that, um, you know, you, you live in those areas, you, you have to play sport, and whether it's football, cricket, you know, basketball, whatever it is, you know, and, um, vividly recall, you know, the community football leagues, you know, I mean, I, I played, you played for Coco United, I played for Stone Killers, you know, you know, and, you know some went on, you know, through, through that, it developed the Queens Park Rangers football team. That is correct. And, and such, you know, you had Stone Killers, you had Living Dead, you had... Um, E-sport and B-sport. Yeah, you know, you, you had teams in the, yeah. in the communities and it was yeah. football. I don't know. I don't think you will know the team Mad Dogs, though. <laughs> yeah, I heard about Mad Dogs, you know. But, yeah. but I'm just saying that to say that, you know, it's, a, it's an important point you're making in terms of the, 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 the community um, contribution. It's not everything GFA, you know, they have a part to play. And I think over the years that, well, then, strengthened Queen's Park Rangers because the, it was basically a feeding ground. You know, right. you had, as I said, the Coco United Stone Killer, Living Dead, um, Uptown Rebels, you know, just name right. it. And you had most of the guys who actually played for Queen's Park Rangers those days came from there. And you had even the Queen's Park Rangers senior footballers who were coaches of those teams. So it's, it's In a, case you don't remember, there was a time when there were four teams in GFA from River Road. From River Road, right. Yeah, Rangers had an A team and a B team, but yet, Paul, you still had Uptown Rebels um, participating, and I'm trying to remember Logan and them team name when they had made a temporary breakaway. Um, the Cecil Victory, Junior Murray. Yeah, um, yeah, that's how the steps there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Jenny, there, there is another um, issue I want us to talk about. Um, it has to do with the a non-disclosure agreement that the GFA signed on to. I understood it came through from the Grenada Olympic Committee and it was um, something that the GFA supported and to some extent signed on to. Why such an, um, in, in amateur sports in Grenada, Cheney, a non-disclosure agreement? Right, so we can look at it as, the glass is either half full or half empty, right? And this is how I feel about it. Because of my privilege as the president of the Grenada Football Association, or because of my position as the president of the GFA, I had or I have the privilege to be in meetings of the Olympic Committee. 
If I was not the president of the GFE, I would not have that privilege. And therefore, I must also understand that the information I receive there, some of it might be considered confidential. Some of it, I ought not to be the one first initiating the, the information going out there, but instead from the secretariat of the Olympic Committee or from the executive or whoever it is. And on the basis of that, I have no issue signing off. Apart from that, while I'm not a member of any board of directors throughout Grenada, um, when you are a board member, you are in a position of authority, a position of leadership, and you are also in a position of privilege. So based on those discussions that you guys may have at that level, there's a certain amount of uh, confidentiality that I believe must go with the position. And therefore, I had no problems um, signing it on behalf of the GFA because I know that if I was not the president of the GFA, I would not be able to sit in those meetings where those discussions taken place. One may argue the fact, but well, we were an amateur. Um, what's the big deal about that? I will ask you the question, how do you feel? I'm sorry, I'll say it differently. It is, in my honest opinion, whenever there is not a regard or respect for confidentiality, that is when organizations fail and they fail miserably. I am about to say something that will cause me problems down the road. It was the same reason why NDC didn't last. Because every time they had a cabinet meeting, some of the executive members were going out there and telling their fans something that was a little bit distorted. It's the same thing that's happening to GFA. And I may not be wrong by the time it really becomes a decay, or I would say like, um, yeah, a, a, a decayed tooth. I may not be wrong. But I will say to you, Michael, the reason why we as board members are there is because we are expected to be treating the business of football with a certain level of confidentiality. We also, however, and I wanted, that's why I said half full, half empty. We also, however, owe it to the council members that we represent to provide them information in a timely manner. The challenge I have with those who are saying, hell no, whatever, is the source of the information coming to the general public. If it is not the official source, then you have what I call distortion, and then you have he say, she say, and different sides and different versions. Hence the reason why I believe to myself, if tomorrow I was to become a board member, I will sign it any day. If my, well, okay, I am a member of Con CONCACAF competition committee, and I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement from the day they decided to make me a member after they did the eligibility check. And I signed it. And you have never heard me, no part of the world, saying something that I sat in a meeting of the competition committee and not wait on the president or the general secretary of CONCACAF to do it. I had the privilege of spending two years on FIFA U17 World Cup Committee. When I sit in those meetings, I am not to take the minutes of that meeting and share it and circulate it. It's not right. And I am saying it's on that basis, I argue on behalf of it. Granted, you cannot force somebody to sign something they don't want to. But it's neither here nor there with me, but I just justify my own opinion on it. Okay. Um... How do you explain your commitment to accountability and transparency and an NDA? Hi, Margaret. It was nice working with you. I can explain that very simple. Accountability and transparency doesn't mean that you have to release confidential information. If you are the press secretary to the prime minister, do you then, because of transparency and accountability, go and you just disclose every piece of information you heard your prime minister say? Or if you are the secretary to the chairman of a board, do you just go and release those information? No, I am saying it comes with the character of the individual. If you are transparent and if you are genuinely accountable, you will provide information to the members in a timely manner. But I'm saying the source of those information should be one, not many. And that's where my issue is. E C oh I think 
Toro as usual is kind of just um teasing you you know uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> Toro likes to tease you but um there, there, there's some issues as it relates to that um NDA obviously that we want to get back to once time permitting and the top of the hour I should tell you that or broadcast Mike. Yeah. Mike, if you don't mind, I hope you have a commercial to play. I must move away from your program well, for a minute. Well, yeah, I was just about to tell you that um, we'll just take a short break and um, yeah. we'll be right back just to let fans know that um, our broadcast is actually coming live to you from um, Buffalo in New York. As you know, it's a special weekend. And um, not just for myself, but also I think for Chenny Joseph, we'll let you know about it uh, later on. Um, the um, he is actually in St. George's. I'm actually in Buffalo, New York, uh, where um, the broadcast this weekend is coming from. Um, nonetheless, um, <clears throat> the Grenada Football Association has been under scrutiny for quite a while. Uh, Chenny Joseph has been the president of the gfa for just about a decade um he has been you know long serving as you can see for the grenada football association he has been on the executive for probably almost 15 um, could be 20 years you know because he has been vice president uh he has worked under the administration the various administrations including that of um ashley ram folks as um president as well um, and he is also um, uh, was well, I should say, former vice president of the Caribbean Football Union, and um, on, sits on commissions of uh, Concacaf. I I believe he might also refer to uh, um, commissions on the, um, if I may add, probably FIFA as well. But he has been around football for quite a while. As we continue with our discussion, um, just to let you know that coming up uh, next um, Saturday on our program, we'll have that of Hazelyn Regis. Well, she's not Buckles. Um, she a former track athlete representing LSU, Louisiana State University as a standout. And uh, she has been, um, been um, a mentor. She has been a mentor to a number of our athletes over the past few years, though she retired from um track and field she's now an educator and um she will be on our program next uh saturday and um in december we'll be starting off with mr victor ashley the former principal of the Grenada boys secondary school and later in december our program will be truncated in the month of december because of the holidays we'll also have um mr bobby benjamin the former president of the Grenada amateur athletic association because then the Grenada Amateur Athletic and Cycling Association, he will be on our program. And just to let you know, next Thursday, there won't be any program because of the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. Let's um, welcome back Mr. Chenny Joseph to our program. That was a quick one, Chenny. Um, let's continue with the discussion. I think um, the um, one has to do with um, so many um, MOUs being signed but it's Argentina, Czech Republic, Mexico, United States, Soccer Federation, name it. It's all well and good, Chenny, for these things to be signed. It looks good, I know, uh, uh, you know, on paper. It's look good for the media. It's look good, you know. <laughs> but in, in reality, Chenny, have the JFA really be benefiting from these MOUs? And if so, can you give us examples? I will say to you all except, and we have not yet signed an MOU with the Argentines, so I just want to clear the air on that. So we is are, it a discussions then? We are pursuing relationship with them. But uh, let me just say that to you. Um, if persons are of a different opinion, I, I beg to differ. The U.S. Soccer Federation has assisted us. We have at least seven coaches who has done the U.S. D license and C license online. Um, you can do your investigation and find out who they are, right? At least two of those seven people are now coaching our national youth teams. Um, apart from that, the U.S. has consistently supported us with things like equipment, whether it is balls, cones, bibs. They have also offered to assist our um, refereeing department 
in more than one way they have provided i personally have transported items being donated by u.s soccer to the grenada football association apart from that the mexican model is one where COVID has unbugged it but when we signed off the very first mou with the mexican football uh, our then technical director can tell you what he benefited from the traveling to mexico our then first vice president who is now second vice president can tell you of what are the benefits there right um apart from that recently ken whiteman and um lyndon langine and Irene lewis have gone off to mexico and they will be able to tell you more about it i don't want to speak on their behalf these mous are still relevant but it is the various departments within the gfa to make use of those opportunities i will say to you it was because of the same mou with the czech republic that the gfa has just received a brand new 70 17 seater bus valued at almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so if that doesn't mean anything to anyone cool now we had five coaches went off to czech republic and to gain coaching experience and knowledge and for some view of what is happening there so that they can come back and uh, impart some of those there. The Czech Republic was actually going to be facilitating um, at least three or four uh, coaches being able to come to Czech Republic for up to six months to be taught in coaching. So those who are, again, I like when you speak about the negative and the positive. I, I can spend a long time with person, and I want to share this with you now, Michael, because I think it's relevant. I may not get a chance to speak again, and I will not come back to rebut to someone else. But I'll say this to you now, Michael. To speak the truth, you don't have to try and remember. But to fabricate the truth, I hope you can remember. That's all I will say for now. Jenny Joseph, the philosopher. Um, <laughs> Jenny, the, it, let's um, talk a bit about the um, issue of match fees that um, had plagued the GFA over the years and probably still continue. Um, and I understood that um, there is now a proposal to have um, the, the women, also the women, to also receive some level of um, stipend or match fees, probably similar to those of the men well it depends on the age group you know but yeah. that has been um a sore point especially at for national football teams over the years Chenny. has that been rectified okay so let's if i just answer you based on your question then i will not be helping those who don't know what you're speaking about previously national players played for the pride and joy of representing the country including myself we did not know what was a match fee when Grenada looked like it had a good run in 2004, that's when Jason Roberts and Shalwi Joseph and Anthony Modest and then became members of the team. As an incentive after we defeated Guyana 5-0, Elliot Maguire, who was the president then, suggested we should give these guys a little match fee. And then we did it for them when they went to um, Ohio. While in Ohio, we got words from the coaching staff that they wanted an increase in the match fee there. Maguire said we didn't have a chance to do it. They said, well, if we didn't do it, they weren't going onto the field. Well, Maguire said, no problem, let the guys go and play. Eventually, good sense prevailed and these coaches went onto the field. However, when we returned to Grenada and Grenada was to play USA here, we lost 3 2. The entire squad, I won't call names now because I, I don't feel it's doing any justice to them. The entire squad called for a meeting at 1 30, and we had to leave the state, the Grandview Hotel, at 2 o'clock, stating that they were not prepared to play if they didn't get married. And Maguire said, Okay, tell me what you want. And they weren't even sure what they wanted. Maguire said, I'll offer you 150, which was EC dollars. They say, no, we want 150 US. So Maguire said, okay, fine, 150 US. And as a result of that, that became the norm. And there have been times, and nobody takes that into consideration. 
where does the money come from to pay the coaches who are training the team or to take care of the training of the team while we're here or to pay for plane tickets to go or to source funding for um, other programs that we do all eight national teams from one source the one little bit of money that fifa is given and so there has been times when our gate receipts has not been as attractive and therefore we have not been able to meet on time the payment of match fees but there has been never a time michael and i say that to you now never in the history i, I sound like ram folks now never in the history of gfa while i've been president that the players have never been paid being paid late doesn't mean you're not being paid right so that part i hope i clear there with you second part i want to say to you is that we have increased the match fees for the players on on, on uh, at least two occasions right i can't remember the amount now so don't ask me but i think they used to be getting something like about 40 us dollars right and it has gone up to maybe i think 100 or 100 and something us dollars per player per match whether or not we host the game so in case you don't know, when we play Trinidad in Trinidad, we don't make any revenue, but we still have to pay them match fee. We have to pay for them to go there. We have to pay for airline tickets. We have to pay for accommodation or meals or whatever. But it's our money, and we still have to pay them, even though we're not making any. Notwithstanding all of that, it was in May that we made the decision that we will offer the same amount to the females once they represent the country at the senior level. So they have not played any game yet. I don't know of any outstanding monies due to any player because of any match fee. I know there was a delay in sending bonuses. And oh, I should mention that because the public don't know all of that. So thanks for the forum so I could let the public know as much as I could, if I remember. When Grenada qualified for the Gold Cup this year, we, sorry, a little before that, we offered a bonus if they qualified. Each player was offered $1,000 bonus, and we have made good on our promise. There are over 1000 EC or US? EC. EC. So that's 23000 we had to give. And in fact, we ran into a problem because when we made it, the coaching staff said they wanted also. Right, so that's twenty-three thousand dollars we had to find and give them, but you you need to give them incentives to these players. And I will say to you, the only people who may not have gotten it yet is because the players, uh, one or two or three players from overseas, because they say, well, Leanna, if you send my money for me, Western Union or a bank, whatever, it's going to cost for me to withdraw. So hold it still. Okay. Uh, I guess as much as sorry, you have the privilege to challenge whether or not this is accurate. This one, this one wasn't fabricated, so I don't have to try and remember. So um, you're basically telling me now that um, the whole issue of the um, remuneration to players that have that issue has been resolved. Are you saying that? I am saying to you there are no issues relating to remuneration for players. Okay, no issues. We do not we do not pay we do not pay players the younger players who are still entitled to US scholarship. So if people are expecting us to pay these players, I am saying I'm going to protect their education by not paying them a dollar. Okay. And you also add in the fact that um the Pure Cup, the Pure Grenada Cup or Pure Cup, whatever you call it now, match yes. has now been added to that. So players and officials are also receiving yeah, you are correct. Okay. Um, Jenny, the issue of the um the constitution, and it has been a board of contention even when we go back way back to 2008, 2009 era of the normalization committee and all these things with FIFA, it always ha has to do with something with the constitution. Um, the, the latest on the constitution and the issue that some of the affiliates clubs are having with the GFA has to do with representation. And I think it has to do with the conference as it is now, meaning that the uh, Premier League teams are represented by their respective um, 
rep representatives. However, when it comes to the conference, uh, it means that you are represented by someone. So five teams in a conference will only have one representative. Uh, Chenny, based on um, an interview last week with um, a representative from the Happier Football Club, there seems to be some concern with that aspect in terms of representation. They believe, the belief is that each affiliate should have their representative, representative or representation at the GFA. How do you as the president foresee um, resolving that issue with the constitution? Okay, um, if you, it was last year, not this year, last year's annual general meeting, I stated to the council that I am one of those who is committed to ensuring that we return to one club, one vote. I am not doing so because I want to be the president the next time around. I'm doing so because I think it's right. And all who have issues with the current statute with regards to representation in council, I say to them hats off and they are correct. How dare you tell me I am a member and I will use Ram Folk's example because we had that discussion before. I'll give you the history of a little bit of the history of GFA to support my point. Hurricanes, St. John Sports, Queens Park Rangers, Hornved, Fontenoy, maybe Carinage, are some of the oldest clubs in the GFA. Yet for all, Fontenoy, who is around since 1969 or, or whenever, don't have representation. They can't vote in the council. Carinage, who's been there forever, don't have a vote in council. Hornved, who has been back-to-back -back champions for the, all of the 80s, don't have a vote in council. But a club that came into existence just two years ago, or I just say that not meaning two years ago, is directing how things should happen for Fontenoy, Carinage, Hornved. Can't be, right? But there's a second part to it, which is the catch. I'll tell you straight up, and I have no apologies saying that. Many of the people who are concerned about that rights to, to, to attend council meeting is not concerned about the development of council and the quality of administration. A lot are concerned about the politics of football and probably voting at a meeting. I'll say to you differently, though. How about when we get back all the clubs to be back, back in council. How about us also saying to the same clubs at the same time, go get back your executive in place. Don't come here with your personal views. Ask how many of the clubs have they met with the members of their club prior to a meeting. I use, for example, the GFA had a council meeting today. I will be surprised at how many of them can say the executive met two weeks ago and discussed certain matters. And following that meeting of their executive committee, they have met with the membership of their club and they have shared with the membership of their club the views of the executive and they have then voted on it and decided to come to today's meeting. I ask you to tell me how much of the same clubs who can produce to you minutes of their last four meetings, I ain't saying in the last four months, because I don't know how often they meet, but the minutes of their last four meetings. I ask you to ask some of them, can you produce to me your annual general meeting minutes for the last year or the last two years or the last three years? And how much people were in attendance at those meetings? I ask you to ask some of them, if that is so correct, when was the last election at your club level? And who were the persons present when you had your election? We play games with football and we play games with information. And I'll say something to you, Mike. I I'm about to make an announcement here that might not sound good. I will leave while I'm on top. 
And I will share with you that I'm satisfied that my tenure so far has been unsurpassed. And I believe I can quite comfortably say I will go smiling that work done during my tenure has been well done. Are you conceding? No, 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 no. I never mentioned that to you. I am saying to you the battles that are being fought are not ones that I think I need to. By the way, tomorrow is my birthday, right? And I'm saying to you, I think I've done a great job for this country. I don't need someone else to tell me. I gave this country seven, 15 years of my time as a player. I gave them three years as a coach. And for the last 13 years, of no, more than 13, 98 to now, how much is that? Whatever I don't, I'm not good at my 22. The last 22 years of my life, I've been given it in administration. So in all, I think 37 years of my life, I have given to this country, not asking or wanting anything in return. Congratulations to you and um, happy birthday in advance, I must say. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as I indicated while, you were, while we were on the break, special for us this weekend. Um, By the way, um, make sure you tell his line, I say happy birthday tomorrow too, and happy birthday to you, by the way. Yeah, well, it's belated. It was yesterday. Yeah. Oh, I sent it to you yesterday, but I'm just saying so now. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, um, special November bond, right? Um, but, Chenny, the issue has to do also with, um, and I think um, Glenn Alexander is saying conferences are not even reporting to members. We have a serious lack of leaders within clubs, and there lies the problem, Chenny, in that um, we have so many teams and over and over we have been speaking about that through the program we have so many teams and few clubs so the questions you have been asking there um are basically you asking teams <laughs> you know to hopefully get their house in order because you know that's a problem we have and it affects um sports across the board not just football, also cricket, whatever it is. And to an extent, it also shows why we have that void in leadership in sports. Because if we do not have strong club structure where people understand what it is, one, to hold meetings, to have minutes, to discuss, to you know, um, report to your constituents, to engage all these things, and you just have a team where probably in most instances, probably a coach <laughs> or even the manager sitting at a council meeting, um, taking decisions, making decisions. This is where we have to, and, and believe sometimes, believe that they have what it takes to be the president of an association, whether it's a GFA or others. That's we where have we have the problem. And sometimes to an extent, Jenny, we do not, people ask for change even at the Olympic Committee. But to all respect, sometimes you ask, but who are you replacing them with? Because there is a void, there is a lack of leadership in terms of clubs and in terms of national associations. Yeah, I will say to you one of my other area of concern, and I expressed it yesterday. I don't know if you are aware of that, Michael. Do you know each of the affiliates of the GFA are not-for-profit organizations registered under the laws of Grenada? And do we know what these not-for-profit organizations have as part of their obligations to report annually? How much of these same organizations can say, raise their hand and say, we are adhering to the laws of Grenada and the requirements on the such a law which requires not-for-profit organizations to do certain reports. How much of us can say that we have had audited financial statements? I'm talking about clubs now. Annual audited financial statements. Well, um, it's it's something for you um, at the GFA, Jenny, to consider in terms of um, um, building 
um, capacity building, as we will say. <laughs> um, it's not just about um, playing on the, the field, the field of play, as we will say. It's not just about, um, you know, providing, you know, that, that sort of training for national teams, etc. But in terms of capacity building, because you want to ensure that there is uh, continuity and um, to some extent, the GFA can assist in ensuring that um, they um, develop and build clubs strong, I should say, not just club structures, but strong club structures, you know. And I'm seeing that um, to some extent, we are, you know, there are examples where Paradise, for example, <clears throat> I think is now um, um, not just a team, but it appears to be a, a, a club. Um, I, I, I understood Fontenot United, for example, not just a team, but a club. I'm hoping that probably Queen's Park Rangers, which pride itself as a club at the years, when you yourself were involved, we had the Queen's Park Rangers football, netball there was also uh cricket and they also participated in track and field albeit with some tight games during over those years so we are hoping that um um from you know gfa probably can lead the process of ensuring because i think it will assist the gfa um ensuring that there's strong club structures um within um those um the, the affiliates i should say in particular and well, encourage them to, 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 you know, to move to that, um, to move to that path as well. But through the, um, through the club licensing program, um, clubs are not supposed to be issued license if they do not meet all of those requirements. So, so hopefully, how many, so and how many have received thus far? No, the the issuing of license has not yet commenced, but it's going to happen soon after the necessary bodies. I think we have to re. Or should I say, reinstitute um, the first instance body and the um, second instance body, and once that is done, then the process will start. Okay, um, Jenny, there are um, some other issues we want to um, discuss, albeit um, not so much, <laughs> you know, controversial. Um, what has been taking place regarding the um, the various committees of the GFA. And I, I say that in that there has been some um, criticism regarding the slow pace of certain decisions. For example, the dis disciplinary committee um, at times, um, you know, and the appeals committee sometimes at times, albeit sometimes, you know, you get quick decisions. But I, I, I know you will say that it all has to do with um, voluntary work by some of its members and therefore when they are available and things like that so but there was an issue regarding i think assault on referees or match officials i should say not just referees match officials sometime back have these things been resolved because i know the disciplinary committee had to meet and to decide on these matters have those things been um yeah i i believe uh, if uh, i mean if i made an in, any error here um uh, I'm subject to correction, but I believe both outstanding matters were resolved. One had to do with Queen's Park Rangers players, and I think a few of them got some suspensions. And then the second one was to do, I think, with St. John Sports players, and they also have some players on suspension. I agree with the concerns of those who say that it takes too long. I, sometimes I feel like if players are facing the same as in our court system because uh, a, a case might be called today and then it doesn't resolve itself until like five years after. Um, if only we could have gotten the members of those two judicial bodies, which are independent, by the way, um, to act a little faster. I think the strategy to get it done is your competition regulation or your disciplinary code can make provision for a lot more summary deci decisions by the FA itself. So, um, you know, if the disciplinary code can make 
provision for a lot more of those summary decisions, then you may not necessarily have to wait on the disciplinary committee or the appeals committee. Um, that's one way of going around it. Okay, so for example, if you are driving with too many passengers in a bus and the police charge you, I think they can charge you a certain amount of money and you have X amount of days to pay it. If you don't pay, then you go through the court system and it takes a little longer. So I don't know if I answer you, but basically, um, I don't think um, we can blame anyone per se because I know for sure the general secretary has been sending many matters to the disciplinary committee. Um, one of the things I think has to fix also is when you send in matter to the disciplinary committee, you should have a basic form which speaks to everything so the disciplinary committee is not guessing what is the desired outcome. Jenny, without um, breaching the non-disclosure agreement, um, the issue with the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association within and we, we, I'm speaking as to you as now um, a member of, you know, CONCACAF in terms of, you know, commissions, uh, committees, etc. cetera. Um, have that um, been discussed at the level of CONCACAF as yet as to, you know, what has transpired, what are the lessons coming out of that um, recent scenario with the TTFA and FIFA? I think at the FIFA Council, there was an announcement that the TTFA was suspended. I think a similar um, correspondence came out. Where well, the they... suspension has been lifted. That is what I yeah, no, I'm talking about, you asked me what was discussed. Okay. I know CONCACAF did send a notice stating that they had until such time to be able to participate in competition. There's no issue between CONCACAF and the TTFA, as far as I knew. So there's no matter to be addressed directly by CONCACAF with regards to the TTFA. However, um, if I'm not mistaken, the strike squad um, would have qualified for World Cup or may have lost to the US on the no November the 19th. And um, they received correspondence from FIFA telling them that they're back in football as of November the 19th. Um, if you ask me, I still, that's just my opinion. I believe it's an internal matter. Um, it's one between the TTFA and FIFA. Um, there's no need for solidarity. If the TTFA has issues, I think it has to be addressed by them and the parent body. Um, so I do not want to go into any details regarding what may have been, um, in my opinion, a very um, direct matter between TTFA and uh, FIFA. But knowing that Grenada has um, experienced a similar fate over the years, don't you think um, it's something that should be of concern, not just to Grenada, but other um, associations in the Caribbean, especially in the Caribbean? I will answer you this way. We will always have someone going to jail for bre breaching the law, and that will continue as long as you are alive. So there's the possibility that another association may one day have the same experience but i don't think it's something that you have to experience i mean express concern about and i say to my members in the gfa all the time including today while i am at the helm i'm gonna guide them and make sure that we in the gfa do not for run foul with fifa um we will adhere to all of the statutes for both fifa and Concacaf. so i don't anticipate under my presidency um grenada having to um, go in any normalization, except maybe there's a surprise coming that I'm not aware of. So I don't think there's a need for a concern. But you admitted that the, um, there's still this rift, there's still this split among your executives. So don't you don't you think such may be of concern to you, or should be of concern to you? No, I, I think I think if it becomes one that is a major concern and. Um, it seemed not to be able to resolve itself. I will be the first to walk away. Oh, all right. Well, um, we'll get some comments from the viewers in a moment, but I want to ask you as it relates to um, a comment made by the president of the Caribbean Association of National Olympic Committees, 
uh, Mr. Brian Lewis on this program on Thursday, in which he suggested the establishment of a Caribbean Court of Arbitration for Sport uh, in the context of the CCJ, for example, because the contention is that um, Caribbean sportsmen and women and administrators, um, when they do have to challenge decisions of international sporting federations, are prohibited by cost, <laughs> you know, and he's looking at more or less a less expensive access to justice, as we call it. Um, what's your take, Kenny, Chenny, on such an idea of a regional court to deal with um, appeals, especially uh, well, um, on sports, eh, I should say, um, okay. along uh, the line of the CCG, as he, as he put it? I will look at it in um, a few contexts. First of all, I think it's a noble idea. Um, it's one that might require more discussions, more thought, and the merit in it. Um, also, it might require one looking at what are the objectives. Is it a case where we feel that uh, caste, you do not get justice? Is it that caste is one that is cost prohibitive? Is it that one that caste is not keen on, you know, giving us um, the necessary audience? You know, we can look at many different things. And I think um, just off the record, the idea is a noble one. However, um, in order for me to be able to give you a firm statement regarding it, I will say to you, I will have to also understand what does the GFA statute say, FIFA statute, CONCACAF statute say about the idea. Now, I don't know if it is proper to sound like I am knocking Mr. Lewis, but sometimes we all you know, jump on what I will recall, I mean, will call, sorry, an opportunity. Um, and maybe because of what happened in Trinidad, he saw an opportunity whereby maybe it's something for consideration. Is it that we are saying that we do not want to be part of FIFA? Is it that we're saying we don't want to be part of CONCACAF? Because if FIFA statute is not changed, whereby FIFA says CAS is the only legit, legitimate body that it will recognize, no matter whatever arbitration tribunal that is established in our region, if we are to retain membership with FIFA and CONCACAF, that arbitration tribunal will be moot. So I think while it's a great idea, I think FIFA might have objection to it because I know you're talking sports in general, but unless the parent bodies like the IOC, FIFA, CONCACAF, I mean, sorry, FIFA, whatever world governing body like ICC and those, except they say to sub-regions, we give you permission to have your own jurisdiction for when you have matters in your region. But if you have matters outside of your region, then you must recognize ours. Then I see that as potentially a problem because the possibility exists that um, a dispute could be between Trinidad and FIFA in the future. Is FIFA going to relinquish CAS versus that Caribbean whatever? Or is there sufficient times that our local sporting organizations, clubs, and individuals have matters to go before arbitration that we require a regional body. In the case of GFA, what we did was we were running into problems where one or two clubs were quickly always running to a lawyer and then going to the courthouse. Um, we agreed on something through a vote and we modified Article 65 of the GFA statute to bring it in line with FIFA. So I don't know if there will ever be a need for the Caribbean, um, whatever is the arbitration body, when in fact GFA, and we recognize here in Grenada um, a final means to resolve any issue amongst us 
is using Article 65 of our own statute. I hope you and your listeners um, understood what I'm trying to say. I did not totally answer you, but I gave you my spin on it. Okay. Um, let's um, get some comments. Richie Oliver is saying it's been a while. I started to move around and try to understand the GFA, but I will say this. There needs to be more professionalism and commitment from the clubs, and I think the FA needs to be more firm in making sure there's a turnaround in this regard in quick time. I agree. I 100% agree with him. That's a fair observation. Um, L. Cork is saying, Kester, uh, no, um, oh, Sherry is saying, conferences are basically a joke and it's definitely steps backward because it has literally denied many clubs a voice in the governing of football, as you would have alluded to earlier. And, um, the, let's start a petition and send it to Joe Biden. We are seeking a full pardon from the U.S. Justice Department for Uncle Jack Warner, one of the Caribbean's greatest football administrators. He didn't do nothing past than current FIFA administrators from Europe and North America haven't done. <clears throat> okay, I'll go first of all to Sherry's comment. Sherry, by the way, great program last week with Mike, you and Kelvin, two good friends of mine. Um, I'll say this to you, Mike, and um, you could use this as coming from me, and it is consistently my word. I am fully committed to seeing the Grenada Football Association return to one club, one vote. However, I also believe the GFA should commit itself, and its members should commit itself to, one, holding clubs to a higher standard, so that you don't have what is going on now and i will tell you plain out there are some people who resent the fact that i have friends beyond football so people like sherry and and mr hector and cado and oliver unfortunately because they are personal friends of mine they feel the wrath of persons but um i think we should hold clubs to higher standard um i also will say to you if you are going to keep these conferences, then the conference should be um, held to a higher standard. But how I will then do it, I will eliminate Premier League. I will eliminate the Premier League um, with regards to them having separate authority in the council. And I will say, if, whether you're in Premier League, second division, first division, or whatever, you are belonging to one or four conferences. And what I will suggest as a consideration also is the board of directors should be the four conference presidents, the two vice president, the president, Karakura, the women's rep, and possibly maybe a referee's rep. And I think you can have a more balanced executive. I think also there should be what is referred to as minimum quality for our competency for persons getting on the board. I think also that persons on boards of directors, whether it is clubs or the GFA, should be held to a very high standard, not one when you're on the executive of GFA and a different one when you are at the club level. So these are some of the things that I think can be done. And I think the community last, but by no means least, Many of these communities should hold these clubs to higher standard too. And some of the professionals who are doing nothing right now should join some of these organizations and help fix it. I think one of the problems we have is, as you mentioned, Michael, some of the coaches are either president or vice president, he's council rep. He, if he doesn't get um, elected on a national team, he then tell you, well, his vote will count. Or if two of his players doesn't make the team, he comes and he wants to vote you out. Those things have to change, especially where FIFA is given so much money now. Um, let's go to our next comment. This is from um, Kester Elcock is saying, I must say that I'm impressed with the GFA grassroots program. I believe other sporting associations can model their grassroots programs, learning from the shortfalls the GFA had in the infancy of their program. 
Yeah, Kesta, thank you, and I hope you're doing well at present. Um, I just want to go further, though. I think we need to also engage private um, schools in football. I think they face what I say an unfair bias by many associations. Now, I do not understand why we tend to want to punish persons who can afford to pay a little for their children. They are left out of almost everything. I mean, I have an issue with that. And I think what the GFA has to also try to do is to engage other associations where I we mean, can have... I have an issue with that. Um, I think what the GFA has to yeah. also try to do. Yeah, so... Um, I think these are some of the things we need to do. But most importantly, Mike, and I said it yesterday to the Minister for Sport, if, if the government through its registry is going to issue articles of incorporation for bodies to function, they must hold these bodies accountable based on the whatever law governs those not-for-profit bodies. The second thing I want to say is that I believe that we should try our best to get some multi-sport clubs in Grenada. And I think there'll be more resources available to each club and there won't be the fight that is taking place now. So for example, we have 19 clubs, sorry, 19 organizations from St. George's in the GFA. We have not been able to see a St. George's team win a major GFA title in a while. Are we doing any justice where some of them, all they have is 20 persons or 30 persons, and you call it a club? A club, Michael, is, a, is one where it starts with its grassroots. It may have about 60 persons there, kids. Those grassroots kids then elevate to making the club on a nine team. The club on the 11 team, the club on the 13, and they move on to 15, 17, 19, and then the senior squad, and then the Grenada national team. There are many organizations, and I didn't say club, in the GFA that cannot put together these different levels I'm talking about. Science has it, and some of the experts say a good club even by our standards, should have a minimum of 1,200 members. How many clubs in Grenada you believe are capable of having 1,200 members? And I explained to you how that 1,200 members could come about without making it some two things. If you even did a small number as 40 at the grassroots level and 30 in every level upwards, you will reach almost 700, right? And if you do the female version to the same thing, then you will see how I, I came up with my 1,200 number, right? How much of our clubs are capable of doing that or even attempting to hats off to Paradise? They're doing a great job. I say to them all the time, you need to now be a big brother in fact, Paradise should see themselves as the United States of America to the rest of the world, meaning you use your influence for a positive. Sorry, not in this time, but what I'm basically saying is the Paradise model is the model that all clubs need to follow. And if you don't, I've spoken to two good friends of mine recently, and I told them I see no reason why they didn't merge. Merge your organization for the purpose of development, not for the purpose of politics and having clout. I am saying we don't need more than six clubs in St. Patrick. And truthfully, the only place where there can be some justification is in St. Mark, because St. John's, for example, once had three major clubs and it caused the demise of all three clubs at the same time. When there was Ball Wizards, St. John Sports, and Hub Roots, it was at the expense of all three because when the better players then aged, all three clubs went out of existence. And mind you, this is what's happening in St. George's now. 
those 19 clubs not helping. Okay. Um, there, there, there are some more comments coming in, Chani, that I want us to, because I, as I warn you, you know, our time is kind of slipping by. We just have about roughly 10 more minutes in the program. And just to remind you that our program is coming live to you from Buffalo in upstate New York. Jenny Joseph is in St. George's, Grenada. And um, Mr. David Gray, St. Lucia is saying, Mr. Jenny, please explain how the GFA has been able to successfully roll out to completion so many tournaments in such a short time since the resumption of sports post COVID in Grenada. Okay um let me say a few of those competitions had started prior to COVID and had reached a significant way for example our u15 tournament is um four groups so they are played different parts of the island so um whether it's eight or ten teams in um, a group and the kids i think play twice a week um however we have each of our tournament has two phases because we are moving from the so-called seasonal three-month activity to a nine to ten month activity for footballers year-round but we are not having any stop per se only the senior tournament that's happening in addition to that though i think we must give credit to volunteers we must give a lot, a lot of credit to the secretariat and in particular, the competition officer. He is a highly competent, well-learned guy who understands it. He's working closely with um, other persons to make sure, and I give credit to the clubs that they are bought into the vision now, so they are seeing the benefit of it. The FA Cup had started, it was a home and away knockout, so that was 37 teams, and then we moved on to the final. The GFA Cup was a shortened version this year, Mr. Gray. However, the GFA Cup is like your parish, and the best players in each parish play, and they do one round against each of their opponents, but this year we did a shorter version. Um, and then we're now moving into the club championship, um, which is uh, four clubs, four teams in a group, I think eight groups. And then we have, well, the knockout, not the knockout, but the Wagiti Super Knockout, which is a knockout. It's a one-off knockout. So um, I think we have learned from the past, and so we're rolling out things much easier now. Um, our women's football is going to start sometime early in the new year, I think, or December, somewhere there. And they are having footballs for the girls from, I think, U7 right up to senior. Okay. Um, let's try to get in some quickly. Um, probably I'll just read the two there. Um, Toro Deputy is saying, expanding football to more areas, to more groups, including women. It's commendable. But personally, I just find it a bit confusing following which competition is starting and which is finishing, especially if you're living outside of Grenada. And um, Glenn Gittens saying, it seems like football is dying in St. George's. When on vacation and I go to Queen's Park, there is no one playing. Before, there were five football fields in the park, and every one of them was heavily utilized. No, there's just one, and it's underutilized. Um, Glenn, part of the reason is we lost, I'm saying it playing out, I say it up to yesterday, we lost two fields to the stadiums and it's an issue i will forever have until i die secondly we have issues where one ground is overwhelmed that is the queen's park ground floor so you have times now where there's a serious issue where four teams are training on that small field and so you find people are losing interest in addition to that though most importantly glenn um the fact that you don't have a signature team from St. George's that one can really follow at this point in time, I think it might just be part of the reason. Rangers is trying to rebound, but the truth is they have not won a tournament since 2005, I think, or somewhere there. Um, and Hunvert is still yet to get back up into the top level, Carnage likewise. And um, 
go again. Well, fentanyl is down there too. So that's part of the problem also. I will admit the best solution, it might be controversial, is to reduce that 19 to about 8 and let the members play at different levels within these clubs. Um, apart from that, I feel that it, what you can do to offset those who will be somewhat displaced is to bring back the minor leagues, like in Willis, in Tempe, in Vendom, in Happy Hill, in Carnage, Granans. So these minor league footballers will play, and then the eight or nine clubs will go look to see if there's talent among them. I think that's the way we have to go. Right now, it's not right. That's my opinion. Well, adding to what you're just saying there, um, is Tory Deputy is saying clubs and teams are good, even better, are excellent footballers. Spectators want their teams and clubs to win, but they attend games to see individual players. Can't name one player in Grenada now that would make me walk from the Carnage to the stadium to see them play. Um, Jenny, is that um, a concern? Is that something that is real? I, I, I agree with 100% of what Toro said. And, I, and my executive can tell you all the time, sorry, Wayne Francis, if you're listening, sorry, the executive will tell you. Um, I've consistently stated that, one, we promote all these games, but we don't promote individuals. The name Chenny Joseph was known even before I became 17 years old because Ray Roberts, Paul Roberts, Troy Garvey, Toro, whoever it was, they were promoting games and they were promoting individuals. So when Carnage was playing Hornbed, it was Sack and Yankee Man and Butterfly and Bread and Toro and others, Roger, Wayne, you know, coming up against the likes of Brim, Dummy Chris, Bob, you know, and Boboy, you know. We no longer do that to our football, and I have a problem with that. The second part of it also is the clubs don't exist. So how else will that same club promote the individuals that we're talking about? I am almost certain, and I saw Glenn was part of your program by thing in there. I am almost certain persons in Las in Latas in St. Patrick could have named 14 players that are likely to start on a Queen's Park Rangers team in 1980-81, all the way up to maybe 1992. I'm talking about Latas in St. Patrick, where a Queen's Park Rangers team in River Road was going there. I'm almost certain the nation could have called out the names of players for almost all of the top Premier League teams back then. Today, we might remember one or two. So I agree. But GFA alone can't fix it. The clubs also... I, I was about to ask you, how do we fix it? Right. So these are some of the things I've said to these clubs before. One, create your own Facebook and other social media pages. And we have consistently stated to them, the GFA can host the page on its page, right? So that we have a central focal point to get information. Two, get your club also promoting them through its own stories. In other words, Queen's Park Rangers can write the results of a match from its perspective and try to get the media to buy into it, right? Thirdly, I will say to you, appoint PR persons within each club. Appoint a photographer, right? And every game you play, you push it out there. That's not hard to do. I mean, I watch at um, a, a magazine that came out recently, The Lead, and they've been focusing a lot on sports in Grenada, also in Forma and The Voice. I think these entities will welcome more information from clubs promoting these individual players. So these are just some of the ways that we, I believe it could be done. But we in the GFA, we are in discussions now with Flow Sports, whereby we are trying to get between 28 and 42 games produced on Flow Sports um, for the upcoming season. And we hope also that we'll be able to monetize these games. So people in the diaspora can look forward to paying a little um, $20 a year and see as much games as they want. Oh, um, is it so that um, 
more top players are migrating to? Do you um, agree with what John is saying? I, I don't totally agree with that. Migration has been consistently so. There was a time when I was a little boy, but I remember it. I probably was like about seven or eight years, and maybe the whole of the Grenada national team went to the US. Maybe only two or three came back, right? But the quality of football remained the same. Um, during the 80s, when Berg and um, Bob Hope and others traveled, football people like myself and Steve Mack and Pele and Zags helped. Even when Zagada and myself and others moved out from the sport, we had the Curry and the Patty and the Nixon, you know, and others. We have consistently lost great players to places like the US and Canada and England, but there that's the and that justifies my point that a club should have at least 1200 members so migration shouldn't affect them well um we 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 we, we bang on time now but um as um i agreed um a little birthday present to the birthday boy well tomorrow is his birthday so i'll give him a little extra just to wrap up on some points because i see some comments coming in you know um but definitely um, the birthday boys, I should say. <laughs> As I said, you know. Um, but um, Pele is saying here um, there is a correlation between lack of interest in football and the absence of live football commentary on radio. Radio commentary brings out fans, and and that's why I'm, I'm saying I want us to, I want to give you some extra minutes because some very important um, and interesting comments coming in there, and I wanted to speak to um, Pele's point um pele is bang on target in fact if andre donald is listening to your program andre would probably say to me chenny so pele had to tell you that wasn't i telling you that for the last two to three years i will say to you the secretariat will will also tell you that i've consistently stated i don't buy the notion that radio commentary will cause fans to stay home in fact it's the opposite when they keep hearing that a Michael Bascom and a Glenn Alexander is playing in a match, after a while they become curious and they want to see who are those people. And then when they start seeing those people, they then become fans of those people or clubs. So Pele, you are absolutely correct. I know that um, the communications department at the GFA is working on trying to get some experts. Hopefully, Michael, you might be one of those experts to train some people in radio broadcasts. And I can tell you that I know part of our 2020-21 season, radio broadcasts will also be um, at least in a minimum amount of games um, going forward. Okay. Well, um, your friend Paul Roberts and the program some months ago did um, indicate that um, he's willing to be, you know, to assist in um, training some broadcasters, you know, um, especially for football commentary. So that could be part of the process as well, Jenny. Yeah, well, um, I will say that openly to you. I am not like some other people. And let Paul Roberts know that I, Jenny Joseph, I don't hold grudge. So I welcome whether it is Paul Roberts or any other person. In fact, last Saturday, myself and Jason Skeet were speaking about the same thing. And um, Jason did volunteer to lend his expertise also. Um, I think we all love the sport. It's just that some of us, we take a different route to get to the same destination. Um, and I will say to you openly, if Paul Roberts is offering his expertise, fine. In fact, I will say to you and to Paul and all others, the GFA is currently um, putting together a studio in the same secretariat building where we can do our own production, such as programs like what you are doing. Or maybe you can be our virtual host when we complete the studio, which is going to be on the third floor. Jenny, I, I promise to give you extra minutes for bonus. That for we'll talk. <laughs> but, no, but I'm, um, I'm serious. Toro is saying twenty dollars a year. That's expensive, Jenny. Man does see EPL and Spanish and German leagues for free, you know. But yeah. um, in all seriousness, no. Um, I want to commend yourself, well, the GFA, and also to Richie Oliver and others, um, even for the quality of the broadcast that we have seen in terms of um the football, albeit the equipment that's, you know, at their disposal, 
you know, not the type that can do, you know, the sports broadcasting as, you know, track and field and, you know, running, you know, motion, I should say motion sports, you know, but um, for what available, it's um, commendable for what we have been seeing, albeit free for now, you know. I, I, I join you, I join you in congratulating Richie, but more importantly, um, Richie will be aware that we, the GFA invested just recently over $22,000 us in two additional cameras um we call them hypad and that is going to be available to richie for future production so you will be more impressed with him anytime after this time around okay and um uh, mr green is just sending a personal message that you check your um your um your messages because i assume winners tv is want to be part of the action as well winners tv uh, out of St. Lucia may want to be part of the action. Well, uh, okay, I will, but he can just simply send an email to GFA Projects at Outlook.com. GFA Projects at Outlook.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So he will get that message there. And let's go to another comment. I remember that's from Clef Deprudin. I remember going into the home of an elderly sportsman and saw a jacket hanging on his wall with an emblem, Grenadian. And with his voice in a whisper, express what that jacket meant to him. I know we don't have the monies to assist, but how about presenting players like the likes of Sampat, Major Jackson, Heads, Ashley, and others with such a token of appreciation? Um, it's something we did within my first two years of going into office. We did do that. Maybe Sampat didn't benefit, but I remember for sure. Um, Jackson was one of those who benefited. DC's um, Mar Morris Sullivan Bull was one of those who benefited. We did that before. I have a fundamental problem, however, and that's why I say everything we do, we have to do it at youth. Um, I feel for my good friend who died now, um, Franklin Drayton. I feel for how things worked out for him in his latter years. I feel it for some of them I see I played with in Guav and the conditions they're at. And so I even feel it more for people like Jackson and others who may have issues. But I have a bigger concern. Why do we wait till people reach in those situations to help them and not try to guide them from since they're young? Hence the reason why I am of this strong, strong, strong view let us go to the U10, the grassroots, the U10, the U13. Let us start shaping or molding the future by being positive influencers so that we won't have too much of those passing through our sport. Um, I will say that I know I personally have been involved in discussion with uh, Lingham Samuel with the lottery trying to help out Jackson in the past. I don't know if that still continues, but we had discussions with the lottery back then and the lottery was giving support to Jackson. Um, the truth is the GFA's funds are guided by regulations. And so there are some things we can't do, but that doesn't mean we don't have um, a chance to do charitable work. I think what we must do first of all is know how many of them are out there before we start lending support because we might just be lending support to one or two and there might be many more out there so mr deprudin i support it but i wish we could avoid that by meeting them much earlier at 8 10 11 12 make sure they're in school they did well and so not much of them will have to rely on what i call handout in the later stage in their lives okay and um i think um people added about moppy um you know and as you rightly said that um <clears throat> you know first you will probably need to do a, a research and probably a database because you may start with one and then find you know that there are so many others you know yeah um, out there um Jenny, the other issues on the burner for the gfa um, what's in store for 20, the 2021 in the short term for the GFA? All right. So um, we, in August, we revised our statute. In August, we revised our statute, I mean, sorry, not statute, um, strategic plan. And there are some short, medium, and long-term plans. Some of the short-term plans include 
um, the primary school, getting into the primary schools with both um, coaches and getting GFA to invest money in competition. It involves the secondary schools investing in competition there, investing more in recruitment of referees, increasing the amount of players, physical players involved in women's football at an age as early as five or six years. Um, and I'm telling you all of these are what we call short term. I know we are also pursuing um, trying to ensure that we can provide greater support for our national program, hence the elite program. I don't know if you heard of it. The GFA elite program, some 42 players will be for two years only playing football and be paid by government with some extra support from us. We will be outfitting them with all of the equipment required to um, to play as if they are professionals. So we have 42 players. We are grooming for the future. And these players will be five days a week training football from as early as nine in the morning until I think after three in the afternoon. Not all of the hours on the field. We will be feeding them every day, um, lunch and a mid afternoon meal before they go back to their respective homes. Um, we are still trying to improve on governance and uh, we are hoping that despite what is going on, that the members who are still on the executive can see the benefit of working together, even if they do not have the same views as some persons. And last but by no means least, we continue to lend support to each of the clubs and we are giving them financial support. And with FIFA um, giving us money for the COVID, re COVID support, um, this morning, so I can make that one public. No um, NDA will prevent me from saying it. Each of the Premier League club will be getting uh, thirty thousand dollars. Each of the conference clubs will be getting twenty thousand dollars. The four conferences, the for the purpose of administration, will receive twenty five thousand dollars. Each of the parish leagues will receive eight thousand um, dollars. There are many academies throughout the country. Each of the academies are again up to, I think, $4,000. And then still our national players at home, each of them will be getting between $500 and $1,000. So in case persons were wondering what we will be doing with the COVID fund, these are how the COVID fund will be spent. Um, you know, 500000 US will go towards women's football, so that's separate. And then today the council agreed that we will reserve a maximum of a minimum sorry of 500,000 ec where we will keep it in what we call um a reserve fund and the payment you refer to there including that of the players that's a one-off payment right yeah that's a one-off payment as a result of fifa and covid okay then well that's something interesting news there at least um what else jenny um for the greater football association <laughs> um apart from what you mentioned there in terms of 2021 do you foresee that we will have a prompt start for the 2021 season normally i think it's in may for the gfa season yeah but the season no we've changed the season the season is supposed to start august ending in may now right However, because of the Waggity tournament and we have the GFA Cup, as I mentioned, um, the Premier League will start in January. But that's a one-off year where it will start in January. Um, so the 2020-21 season has already started. Um, we finished two competitions already, right? However, we have the um, GFA Cup, which will end on December 5th. And then we take a break, and in January we start with the Premier League and conferences. Yeah, but but how things are now? We are we on track to start the um, Premier League and yeah. conferences in January? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, yes. Okay. Well, and I, I assume that is barring that we keep the COVID under control as it is now in terms of any future lockdowns or anything like that. Yeah, and I, I just want to use this opportunity to encourage us Grenadians to be more 
careful about how we go about living our lives, even during this COVID time. The guy next door could be easily the next person testing positive. Granted, we have not had any debt yet. I think it is a responsibility of each and every one of us to adhere to all protocols and to ensure that we keep Grenada as low as possible in terms of positive cases. Um, I know we have had football, even last week I saw a video where there were hardly anyone wearing the mask. I want to say to those who are attending football games organized by the GFA or Wagiti or anyone, um, please don't leave home without a mask. Please walk with, if possible, a small bottle of hand sanitizer. Please adhere to the social distancing or physical distancing. Those things are not just because it comes from the police or the government, but those things are to ensure we live at least a little longer and we were around in 2021 when Biden is sworn in as president of the US. Um, and finally, Chenny, um, re and, and regarding that same point, do you see um, that in terms of, especially at the, the stadium, the national stadium, an increase in terms of spectators in future matches? Because I know that has been a concern as well for the public in terms of, you know, tr you know hoping to be a spectator, but because of the, um, the contracted numbers, because of the limited numbers that you can accommodate at the stadium. Um, I, I will say something that could be controversial, but I will say that openly. I see no reason why between 500 and 1,000 persons cannot be allowed into the stadium, utilizing the entire stadium and have the same um, regards for all protocols relating to COVID. Including social distancing? Yes. Okay. I mean, the stadium can hold 7,000 persons, right? And if I said between 500 and 1,000, I'm certain you could get more than um, a seven feet distance or a 10 feet distance among spectators. Granted, the host of any of those, though, will have to spend more money to make sure there are wardens and security to ensure people re respect it. But I don't see why we will just limit it to that. And instead, those who can't come, they go to a happy hour or they go out on a boat and or private party and they're even closer and they're dancing up in each other's face. Okay, then. All right, and Cheney, I want to thank you very much for being part of our program um, this weekend. It has been long overdue. I know since um, probably August or September, we have been talking about being on the program, and you indicated that you will be available November 21st. I don't know why you chose that date, but I could understand to an extent. No, no, let me just say to the public um, now. <laughs> let me say to the public, I wanted to be in the middle of celebration between Hazelan and yourself. And there was no other date I could have chosen. I appreciate that, Cherry. You, you know, never mind. The public don't know. I, I say that to people. Don't worry about Michael and I business, even if you see me banter publicly. All right. Um, just some comments before we go. I know we get already. Think the bathroom policing is a problem, and I think it relates to the, um, the, the COVID. And um, Cherry is right on that. Read the stadium, the additional advantage the stadium has is air circulation, which is also key. Um, you know, and I think um, this is um, important, especially for the, the, the stadium itself and its location. I think Kenny is, as Margaret is saying, is key here in terms of air circulation. And there's no reason why we um, could not have had more people um, at the stadium, especially with the, the bleachers the secondary pavilion, and you could, as you well said, um, could have been probably between probably 500 even to probably a 1,000 spectators could have been accommodated easily at the stadium. Yeah. I, I want to just make my parting words, Mike, as being one where I send out an open invitation to uh, all Grenadian and lovers of Grenada in the diaspora. Plan your holiday with your bosses, and know that Grenada will be playing a minimum of three matches in the U.S. come June, July, August, thereabout. So start planning your holiday, monitor CONCACAF website, and I expect that um, Grenadians, wherever you are, 
will all be there to support our Spice Boys when they um, come for the third time in the uh, Gold Cup in the U.S. But remember, as um, they indicated and Toro rightly said too, what is also important is knowing the players. So it will also be important for those who want to support um, Team Grenada, the Spice Boys. They know the players and about the players. So leading up to all of that will be important in how we, you know, promote the players yeah. representing Grenada. Um, sorry, then, before, you go, Mike, before you go, because it's ironic. I mean, you, as you rightfully said, this this program is one that obviously i thought it was too much time i had committed to you but i realized it's not enough i just want to mention that we have established a, a gold cup committee um the gold cup committee which is chaired by uh, colin dow and deputy chair is Lyden ramdani includes the current um gta uh, chairman which is barry collymore um, roger duncan glendon langine these people are currently working on a program whereby they are promoting the spice boys and they will do it in many different ways they are doing a proper video launch they are doing a series of billboards and other marketing strategies and they are also attempting to raise close to uh, us one million dollars um, to help our national team to participate, not just in the Gold Cup, but also the FIFA World Cup. So I forgot to mention that, and um, I think you will see a lot of feature on individuals on the team um, in the coming months. Jenny, you forgot to mention a committee looking to raise almost a million dollars? Yeah, One because million US dollars that's a lot. Your interrogation, your interrogation has okay. deviated me from the truth. Yeah. But, but, but on that final note, Jenny, um, what's the situation in regards to appointing a national coach since um, the exit of Shalvi Joseph? Okay, what I can say to you is that the decision has been made by the GFA with regards to the candidate. Um, the candidate and the GFA are, I will say, 98% ready for it in fact we were targeting making the announcement for december 1st but um until such time that he has physically signed the contract i don't think it would be fair to announce it but what i can say to you is a high quality coach um, will be well known by a lot of people in the diaspora and i'm um, hoping that with his kind of credential we can cre create the kind of impact we want to create in future tournaments but we have already chosen the coach he's a high level coach has a professional um certificate has coached at the highest level i can mention this has coached canada national senior team has coached canada under 23 team has coached canada olympic team has coached canada on the 17 team has coached professionally is very involved in canadian football at the highest level presently and um, I believe the individual is a quality coach that we can expect some good results from. Thank you for that bit of information, Jenny. And um, I'd like to thank you for being on the program. Thank you the best in the special day on Sunday. Advance, Jenny. Thank you. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Um, folks, Jenny Joseph, the president of the Grenada Football Association, is also a former national player and captain and um speaking with us live from st george's our program emanating from buffalo in new york this weekend just to let you know there is no program on thursday thanksgiving in the united states but we will have a program on saturday but i want to thank you again for um participating in our program and join us on saturday as i indicated from one o'clock in the afternoon that's eastern time which is two o'clock um, Caribbean time, Eastern Caribbean time. This time we'll be joined by Hazel Buckels, formerly Hazel and Regis, a former national track athlete. So once again, thank you very much, all the folks who have been chiming in with your um, questions, with your comments. I want to thank you once again and look forward to be with you on Saturday, God's willing. So until then, stay positive, test negative. <laughs>